Well, good morning. Okay. I thought it was only because it was 9.30 that the other crowd was, you know, not very enthusiastic. But it's 11. It's 11.24. Okay. Good morning. morning. All right. There there we go. There we go. Thanks. That's good. That That was a little bit more enthusiasm. Well... I'm Marshall, I'm on the team here, and it's my privilege to bring the Word of God this morning as we open it together. And um, for the last several weeks, Brian has been basically teaching on uh, how our priorities um, really form our instincts and how we respond when we're under pressure. And and today, as we, we bring this sermon to a close, where we bring this series to a close, we're going to talk about just the relationship between forgiveness and bitterness and how if our proneness is to forgive, if that's, if that's our priority, then the tendency when we come under pressure is to be forgiving. But if our proneness, if our disposition is towards holding things against people and not forgiving, then when we're under pressure, when we experience problems, when we experience pressure from others, particularly, we will then respond with bitterness. And in fact, I, I would say, and I'm gonna kind of develop this a little bit, if there's so, even just one person that you're really holding on to and refusing to forgive, I am convinced that that is, com- that is affecting your responses and your relationship with everybody else, basically. And so we're going to look at what the Word of God says about forgiveness. So if you'd open your Bibles, if you have a a copy of God's Word, or if you have it on a digital device, or if you brought your stone tablet to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 31 and 32. Now, this is a couple of verses that are part of a letter that uh, leader of the early church, Paul, the apostle, uh, he wrote to some Christians in a town called Ephesus. It's in modern day Turkey. Uh, They were generally younger Christians and he spent some time in this letter kind of describing to them what all has happened. You know, as they they gave their lives to Christ, he's describing all all that that means, all the spiritual blessings that are theirs in Christ. And that's most of the early part of the letter. But then he transitioned and certainly by the time he's in chapter four, he's describing to them what the Christian life then looks like. If, if all these things are true, if I'm blessed with every spiritual blessing, then, then what does it look like then to be a Christian? What, what is, what is, how do I apply all this truth in my life? And so these couple of verses we're gonna look at are, is kind of part of that overall description. So beginning with verse 31, chapter four, the book of Ephesians. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Father, I ask that um, as we look at your word and as we learn from you that you would just open our ears uh, to hear spiritually what you have to say to us each individually. I pray that you work within our hearts and that uh, our hearts would be soft and, and, and pliable to, to be able to move in the direction and to, to respond as you want us to. And then, Father, I pray that you would give us the strength in our wills to, to um, take whatever action, adopt whatever attitude you call us to have as we hear and as we listen to your word. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, truth is, this is, I'm just right off the bat, this is kind of a heavy topic, particularly for many of us because we have experienced incredible hurt. Maybe there are people that have hurt you. There is a person in particular who has hurt you very, very deeply, and it's affected much of your life. 
And so anytime you hear a message or you hear the the idea of forgiveness mentioned, your instinct, your response is really to maybe shut that down. Because at some level, it's in your mind that that to forgive that person, because that person came to your mind as soon as the word forgiveness came up, that person, to forgive that person seems to be almost not right. It's like that person is getting away with what they did to you. And that just doesn't seem right. And, and so forgiveness just somehow doesn't, it, it just is, is painful to even think about the idea of forgiving. But I wanna suggest to you that one of the reasons you are having a difficulty with the idea, and, and so your temptation, by the way, is probably to, to, to maybe even shut down and not really listen and, oh yeah, forgiveness, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I've heard all of it before and I just don't like it. I, I don't want to hear it. Um, I, I'm going to think about what I've got in the smoker. I'm going to just think about lunch, whatever. But I, I want to ask you, please, before you shut down, let me, let me give you an opportunity to, to, to think about something, and that is this. Maybe, just maybe, what you have heard about forgiveness isn't exactly what God's word says about forgiveness. It isn't exactly what, you've kind of been given maybe a a skewed version of forgiveness. And so I want to begin today by describing what forgiveness is not. Before we talk about forgiveness is, let's, let's see what forgiveness is not. The first thing forgiveness is not is it, it's not pretending It's not pretending about the wrong that has been done. There's different ways that we, that that folks sometimes seem to encourage us to do this. Uh, For one thing, it might, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, it it was nothing. Like, like this great hurt that we think about, if you're going to really forgive, you just have to kind of excuse, excuse it. You're excusing what the person did and you're, you're kind of uh, not really even grabbing hold of it anymore. Just saying, okay, it didn't really hurt. It wasn't that bad. I mean, that's okay in a, in a pickup basketball game. If I elbow you and I say my bad and you say, oh, it was nothing, you might really mean that. But if someone has hurt you deeply, if they've really wronged you, it doesn't help to just pretend it didn't and call that forgiveness. In fact, folks like to talk about, you know, forgive and forget. No, forgiveness is not forgetting. I don't think Jesus forgot when he hung on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He wasn't forgetting that he was being crucified, (laughs) but he was forgiving. It's not denying the pain. Okay, I can forgive if I just pretend it didn't hurt me. No, no, it did. Go ahead and own it. Go ahead. It's not ignoring the wrong. Forgiving someone doesn't mean you, you, you remain in, a, say, let's say, an abusive situation. You, you don't remain in, in abuse and say, well, because I'm forgiven the person, I've got to keep enduring. No, no, no. In fact, I'm going to get to this in a moment, but one of the aspects of forgiveness is that you truly desire God's best for that person who wronged you. Well, guess what? It isn't God's best for an abuser to continue abusing. Forgiveness also doesn't mean not guarding against further wrong. In other words, just because you forgive somebody for what they did, doesn't mean you automatically trust them. Mom, if if your son has a drug problem and has stolen money from your purse, you can forgive him for his theft. You can forgive him for stealing from you, but it's not a failure to forgive if you no longer leave the purse on the kitchen table when he comes over. There's a guy I knew named Jesse Villarreal. Jesse Villarreal. He was a guy I knew in South Texas, and um, he grew up and kind of in the barrio, and ended up in LA and was involved in 
drugs and all kinds of stuff, and he would come back home and, and try to and visit his mom. And, and he, he tells a story. God got a hold of him eventually, and, and, and he was radically, radically, radically saved and delivered from his drug addiction. It was amazing. But he tells the story. He says, you know what? The best thing my mom ever did for me. This is his mom. His mom loved him. He said, you know, I meet all these guys who are on drugs and are messed around and, 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 and you know, they, they come over in the middle of the night and, and mom gets up and says, Miha, let me fix for you some, some, some you know, some eggs. Let me make some tortillas. He said the best thing his mom ever did for him was refuse to let him in the house. <laughs> said, no, I'm sorry, I can't let you in like this. He said that was a wake-up call. Now, do you think his mom didn't forgive him? Oh, his mom's heart broke for him. But she didn't fail to guard herself against the consequences or to refuse to allow him to experience the consequences of his addiction. So forgiveness is not ignoring the wrong. It's also... I've got to be careful about this one. But forgiveness is not the same as, it might result in it at times. And there are certain circumstances, and for, perhaps that's it, this is an ideal, and in an ideal situation it does, but forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. That's a whole other sermon, a whole other series. Forgiveness itself is really more about you and your heart and your response to that person who has wronged you, as well as your response to the Lord. There's a vertical aspect too. But, but it's not really reconciliation. In fact, sometimes it's impossible to reconcile, at least this side of eternity with someone. For example, the, if someone is dead, you, you can't reconcile with them. And, and, and there, there are some of you, I bet in a, in a room this size, I bet there are a number of us here who have people who have gone, they, they've already died, but they hurt us deeply. And maybe we never really, we certainly never reconciled and maybe we still haven't forgiven them. Maybe you have a parent that really was not a good parent and really mistreated you and you still carry in your heart just a anger, maybe even hatred for the way your father treated you, the way your mother or your sister, your brother, your uncle. But that person's dead. That's my experience. I was 13 years old. My parents got divorced. I'm an only child. Um, divorce is, is hard for every, any child. But when you're an only child, it really blows up your world. Because all it is is you, your mom, and your dad. And when they split up, my world was destroyed. It was painful. I stayed with my dad. There's a whole other story behind that reason I did. But I stayed with my father. And within a few months of the divorce... He married a woman that he had met since the divorce. Well, she ended up being, amongst a number of other deep problems, she was addicted to drugs. Prescription drugs and probably pretty much any kind of drugs she could get her hands on. And if there's anyone that has been in the home of an addict, particularly when you were a child or younger, a teenager, when the addict is an adult, it really creates chaos. And, and, and the thing that is so hard about being in the home of an addict, at least this was my experience, is, is you know that there are lies, you know that there are, are things that just aren't right, but at some level you can't really, you can't really articulate it, you can't really express it, you, you in some ways don't understand, but you know something's not right. And that went on in my household. I eventually went away to college, but... About five years after that marriage, five years after she became my stepmother, my father died of cancer. I was 19. And honestly, from the moment he died, pretty much, except for one incident that was fairly ugly, I had nothing to do with my stepmother. Until a year later, she, in a freak accident, died. And actually, I went to her funeral. I, I, the reason I did is I, I, I had some connection with some of her family members and, and, I, and I just, I felt like I should. So I went. 
And it was one of those funerals. You ever go to a funeral of somebody where there's kind of a parade of people that they allow there to be a testimony time and there's a parade of people who talk about how wonderful that person was, but you know the truth? Well, that was one of those funerals. And then and the reality was that was their experience of my stepmother. She really was, a, I mean, in many ways, she was a great person, particularly publicly. But I can tell you behind closed doors, I can tell you at home, that wasn't the person. And maybe you've had that experience. And so I left that funeral. I took all of my thoughts about my stepmother, not just my thoughts, my feelings, which were borderline, if not, let's be honest, hatred. And I just kind of put them in a bottle. I put a top on it and I stuck it on a shelf of my soul and I kind of laid it aside. Years went by. I went into ministry. I preached and, you know, rarely would I mention my stepmother. And if I ever did, immediately the feelings would arise. And I was that angry Pain, pained teenager who hated what had happened and found myself hating her. And so I tried not to say much or think about her and laid it aside until about 20 years after she had died. 20 years. I'm in the shower one day of all things. I think I'd been reading a book or I'd heard a sermon on forgiveness and And honestly, I kid you not, I really sensed that the Lord said to me, you need to forgive. And my stepmother's name came to mind. And I thought about it and I realized, yeah, I really do. And so right there, I said, in the name of Jesus, I forgive. And then I said her name. I did it out loud. And you know what? I didn't feel anything immediately. It wasn't like, you know, the heavens opened and my heart was all filled with, you know, good feelings and butterflies and a wonderful feeling. No, I mean, I, I just it was kind of matter of fact. But I can tell you from that point on and over the years, I don't, when I think about her, I, all I can think of is, you know, someday, and I believe she was a believer. She had her troubles, but she knew the Lord. And I believe I'm going to see her in heaven one day and I want to give her a big hug. And, I, and, and, and anything, now, now I, haven't, I haven't forgotten obviously what happened. I haven't forgotten the difficulties and the pain that it was for me at the time. But it's just kind of a matter of fact thing for me now. Yeah, it is, it was. Not to be cliche, but it is what it is. It, it no longer has that emotional effect on me at all. And I don't hold that against her. And to imagine that she's with the Lord now, that gives me joy. It's not necessarily reconciliation. There's other times it's really not possible to be reconciled. Maybe the person is continuing to abuse. Maybe the person is still a danger to you or to other people. Maybe the person, it just, you, 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 you can't, That person won't acknowledge the wrong in any way and is a continued threat. Yes, and so but you can still forgive that person. It also forgiveness also is not a lack of consequences. If a person has committed a crime against you, you know you actually can forgive that person, but still press charges. Yeah, really. Why? Because if part of forgiveness is wanting God's best, maybe what that person needs to do is be taken off the street and no longer be a threat to somebody else. Forgiveness also is, it doesn't, so there's a mindset that I think we have. When we think about forgiveness, what what sometimes comes to our mind is, yeah, but somebody's gotta pay. They've got to pay for what they've done. Well, here's the deal. God promises that someone will pay. For one thing, in Romans 12, 19, he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We're called to leave room for God's wrath. In fact, he can handle vengeance and he can handle wrath. He can handle repaying a whole lot better than we can. And it actually is his domain, it's not ours. We don't have the right to repay. We don't have the right. That's, that's, that's God's right is vengeance. And we need to trust that the 
someone will pay. <laughs> now, if the offender responds in faith and puts their faith in Jesus Christ, then that punishment, that vengeance that is upon, that would be upon that person eternally for what they've done, it is now placed on Christ. You were told in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he, Jesus, uh, our God made him sin, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. That's the beauty of the gospel. When, when we put our faith in Christ, all, all the punishment that we deserve, that you deserve, that I deserve, is, is placed upon Christ who was completely innocent, he had no, and completely sinless, there was no, no sin that he needed to pay for, and so he is able to pay for ours. And so that person who has wronged you, yes, if they put their faith in Christ, they will not have, though the eternal consequences have been placed on Jesus and he's taken them and that person is forgiven eternally. Now, that per, the person may still, if it's a crime or whatever, they still might go to jail. There still may be, may be consequences here, but they really will be eternally forgiven. Final thing that forgiveness is not is it's not a feeling, uh, I, I've met folks at different times and I've talked to people, particularly as a pastor, that, you know, they, they, they say, well, well, pastor, I want to forgive so-and-so, but I just, I, I just can't find it in my heart. I just can't feel it. Forgiveness is not a feeling. It, it, it's not. In fact, more often than not, feelings follow. It was like the story I told about my stepmother. I did not feel any forgiveness for her. until after I had decided and declared my forgiveness of her. Feelings follow. So what is forgiveness? Well, the first thing is forgiveness is a decision. You decide. It is a decision before it's anything else. You decide to forgive you make the decision, I do forgive so-and-so. And in your decision to forgive, you are saying two things. I will not hold this, fill in the blank, whatever it is, against him, against her. And then secondly, you say, I want God's best for him. I truly want God's best for her. That's the decision. But you want God's best. You want that person to be blessed, but God determines what that blessing means. You want God's best, but that doesn't mean necessarily continuing in their crime or finding success. You, you, if, if, if they've stolen from you, if they're an abuser, you don't want them to be Become more of one. You, you, so, so wanting what is best is wanting God's best. But, but, but it's not up to you, though, necessarily to tell God what his best is for them. It's just your, your, your responsibility to say, God, you know what is best, and so I truly want what is best. So, I'm going to tell myself, Pastor Royal will probably rebuke me after this and tell me this is really bad pastoral care, but, but I, got, I got to tell you something. It was, it was a lesson I learned. So at one point, particularly early at a, particular, at a church in South Texas where I was pastor, when I didn't know a lot of the members, and even if I did, there were always people that I'd get a phone call who, you know, they were members of the church, but they hadn't been there in years, so I didn't know them, but, that, but they'd be in the hospital, and so I'd be asked to go visit, and so I'd go visit them in the hospital, which was great. I, I love visiting and praying for people and encouraging them and, and, and helping them to kind of look to the Lord in, in the midst of, 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 their, of their whatever reason they're there, but at the same time, if I don't really know the person, it's kind of hard to know really what to pray for. Right? I mean, I can pray that God will heal them, and that's a good thing. I can pray God's blessing, and that's a good thing. But there were times I thought, well, what else do I really, should I pray? 
you know, I, d- does God want to maybe teach them something? I mean, do I want to pray that? Do I? So finally, one day it hit me. It was like, well, you know, one thing, Marshall, you can always pray for is you can pray that God would draw near to that person. Because if you look throughout Scripture, there's two things that God always does when he draws near. He draws near for one of two reasons. Sometimes both, but, but, but usually one or, one or the other. Number one, when he draws near to somebody, he does it to bless, to encourage, to strengthen, to empower. That's one way that God draws near. And certainly if someone's in the hospital, you want to pray for that, that's great. But there's another reason that God draws near. If you look through the scriptures, it's for judgment and for discipline and for kind of turning them into the, in the direction he wants them to go. And so I thought, you know what? If I pray for God to draw near, I can't go wrong. <laughs> so next time I pray for you and I ask God to draw near, you'll know I don't really know what to pray for. No, so, but that's what you can desire for that person who has hurt you. I draw near to them. I don't know what that's gonna look like in their lives, but I do know that it's certainly best for you to draw near. Forgiveness also, it flows downhill. It's a a downhill flow. We forgive as we have been forgiven. And in fact, I, I would suggest, in fact, in his recent book on forgiveness, Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller, basically said that if we don't forgive, we are displaying the fact that we don't understand the forgiveness that we have. Jesus basically gave us a parable where this is, uh, this is illustrated very strongly. So after Peter had, had asked him, uh, this is in, in Matthew chapter 18, uh, and verse, starting in verse 21, Peter asks him about how many times he should forgive. And, and Jesus' response was, you know, 70 times 7. And he wasn't giving like a definite number and like you stop after time 77. He was basically saying, just do it abundantly. Have a disposition that way. But then he tells a parable. He tells a story that has a purpose. It has a, has a point. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a talent was a unit of measure, of weight. And you might have in your footnote what that is. A talent was 20 years of wages. One talent was the weight of, of 20 years of the monetary unit of, of, of wages. 20 years. And so imagine 10,000 20 year of wages. I mean, that's like an astronomical number. It's huge. It's like a gazillion. I mean, you know, it's just crazy. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Number one, he, there, was, there was no way. He, there's no way. He couldn't live long enough to pay him everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. A denarii was one day's wage. So let's use it, let's kind of translate it into today. This makes easy math. Let's imagine a day's wage is a hundred dollars. Let's just imagine, okay? It's easy math. A hundred dollars. Okay, so a hundred, a hundred dollars, my math tells me it's not, it's 10,000, am I right? Really quick, yeah, 100, 100, 100 times 100, 10,000, right? Yes, tell me I'm really wrong. Okay, nobody else knows math here. That good, I feel comfortable. Even though I oversee a little bit of the finances here, that's scary. No, but 10,000. Now, $10,000 is a lot of money. I mean, you know, it is a lot of money, but, but it's probably repayable to, to a point. I mean, it would take time, but one can repay 10,000. So look, look what happens. He says, have patience. It says his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused. 
the guy he owed to, and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you have had mercy? Should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. We forgive because we've been forgiven. And if we really recognize how much we've been forgiven, we'll have an open heart to forgive others. And if you don't recognize your need for forgiveness, you won't forgive others. Another thing that forgiveness is, is it's trust that God is good and in control. It's trust that God is good and in control. We, we see a great example of this in, in Joseph's life. Joseph, we read about him in Genesis. Um, won't go into too much detail, but he grows up in a household that's a little dysfunctional. He's the favorite son. His daddy gives him this nice little coat of many colors. His brothers kind of resent him. And, and of course, Joseph doesn't help himself because he tells his brothers and his whole family about dreams he had that seem to indicate that they're going to someday bow down to him. So when his brothers get the opportunity, they basically, first they want to kill him. And they're kind of stopped from doing that. But they're able to sell him into slavery. And so he becomes a slave. He gets taken to Egypt. And actually, it's not such a bad gig because the guy that buys him puts him in charge of his household. And it's a, it's a high official uh, in, in, in Egypt. And, and, but then the, the, the official's wife tries to seduce Joseph. And Joseph refuses and runs out and leaves a cloak because she's grabbing hold of it. And then she accuses him of raping her. And he ends up in jail. And he's there for many years. He has one moment where it seems like he's going to get freed because one of, the, one of his fellow inmates worked for Pharaoh and um, actually ended up being released. And then because Joseph had interpreted some dreams, uh, he told Joseph, he goes, I'll remember you. I'll let Pharaoh know how great a guy you are and you can interpret dreams. And then two years goes by and nothing happens until finally... Joseph does get released. He interprets a dream for Pharaoh. Pharaoh makes him number two in the whole kingdom of Egypt. And once he's in that position, his brothers actually have to come to get food because Egypt, there's a big famine. Egypt's the only place where there's food. And Joseph is the guy who decides who gets food. So they come before him and a lot of things happen, but at the end of the day, the brothers ask him, they beg him to, when they find out who he is, and he reveals himself and over some time, and he, finally he says, they, they say, please forgive us, basically. Dad said you're supposed to forgive us, and his response to me is the most powerful. It, 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 it's, it's such an example of forgiveness, but it's also an example of the reasoning one of the great reasons behind forgiveness. He says to them, am I in the place of God? In other words, if I hold it against you, I'm, I'm being your judge, not God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. See, part of... Forgiveness means that we trust that God is good and is in control. And even that painful experience, even that harm that that person did to me, I know that at some level God at least permitted it, but God is also to, able to take it and turn it into his glory and to my good. We recite Romans eight twenty eight. If we know that for those who love God and are, you know, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. All things, even those things, even that painful, painful experience, even that long period of time where we were mistreated. 
even that, God is able to take it and work it to his glory and our good. We have to recognize that. That's how we're able to forgive. We can say, all right, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand. It was painful. It's affected me that I still have scars. I'm not going to pretend it's not painful, but I will forgive the person because I know you're in control and I'm going to trust you. Finally, it also is freedom. Man, when you don't forgive, you become a prisoner to your offender. When you don't forgive, you become a prisoner to your offender. Because now that person and what he has done, what she has done, defines you. But when you release them, you release yourself. So how? How do we forgive? The first is we depend. We depend on the Lord. We depend on the Lord for three things. One is we pray. We pray for God's view of the situation. That's the first thing. We pray that we can, to some degree, have Joseph's mindset about the pain and say, and be able to say, okay, that person meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. We pray. We pray for God's conviction, really of our own sin. I'm not saying we blame the victim. That's a, big, that's a big thing in today's culture. Oh, you're blaming the victim. No, no. But the truth is, just because you're a victim of something doesn't mean that you no longer have any responsibility for your other responses to other things. And there's sometimes that I think that, 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 that that's kind of where we, we tend to be. But we need to recognize and ask the Lord to show, where have I sinned? Where have I sinned in response to what that person did to me? If my parents mistreated me, and, and, I, and I hate them for it. How have I then treated my kids? Have I been responding to them with that, the same thing? No, confess. And yes, then confess your own unforgiveness. And then you depend on the Lord by praying for God's best for the person who has hurt you. Depend, decide. Resolve to recognize that God is in control, that all things really do work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Decide. Doesn't matter whether you feel it. I'm not feeling it. That doesn't matter. You're not feeling it. You decide. Make up your mind that you will forgive, that you do forgive. I'm going to tell you, there was freedom the day I decided to forgive my stepmother. There was so much freedom. But then the third is we need to declare. Declare. Declare to the Lord and in the name of Jesus that you forgive that person. Confess, though, your own sin, your sin of unforgiveness, and sins that maybe you've excused because of what that other person did to you. Confess your sins to the Lord. Now, I hesitate to say this, but I mean, you have to be aware of the situation. This is really, at least today, the, 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 is more about your heart and your attitude. But, but, but if, if, the, if it If the relationship is such that you can, you need to tell the person who hurt you what they did, but that you've forgiven them. Now, not always, I mean, to be around them, if it's to put you or others in danger. No, 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 of course not. But you might need to tell somebody, particularly if you know that person knows that you're holding it against them. And then I would encourage you to particularly if you haven't been able to tell that person for various reasons, maybe they passed away, you need to tell someone else. And you don't even need to, and I don't mean tell somebody else that you've forgiven so-and-so and then come up with a list of all the things they did to hurt you, which basically means your telling is just your way to like get back at the person who hurt you by naming all the things they did. That's not what I mean. I mean, tell them, I tell someone else, just I, even if somebody, even one of the pastors in, in a moment or their, their spouses, 
Say, I forgive so-and-so. Even that person doesn't know that per- so-and-so. In fact, that's even better. Just, it's just so that you express it. It's important to do that. To say it out loud, I forgive. So depend on the Lord. Decide to forgive and declare your forgiveness. Now, what are the next steps? What is kind of an immediate response? And I want you to think about that person right now who hurt you. You maybe have been thinking about that person ever since you found out this was about forgiveness. Think about the person who hurt you. And here's what I encourage you to do in a moment when we have a time of response, when we ha- have an opportunity to, to, to come here to what we generally call the altar and maybe you just wanna come before the Lord to kind of hear and just kneel or, or you wanna come and speak to one of the pastors or one of their spouses and just either ask them to pray for you or to maybe tell them about your, the fact that you forgive and ask for maybe prayer to continue to do whatever you need to do in response to that. But there's really three things I'd encourage you to do just immediately in response. First is go ahead and lament your pain. Get with the Lord and just declare to the Lord. Say, Lord, that person really hurt me and here's what hurt. Go ahead. God, it's not like God doesn't know, but, but go ahead and, and own it. Sometimes we, like I said, we sometimes think that forgiveness means we kind of have to stuff it, for, pretend it didn't happen, pretend it didn't hurt, pretend it wasn't wrong. No, no, go ahead and lament. Lament your pain. And then back off. And as you're still with the Lord in your heart and your mind, maybe it's gonna be at your seat, maybe it'll be here, confess your sin. Confess your own sin of of not only unforgiveness, but perhaps using what that person did as an excuse to sin against others. And then finally, in your mind, in the presence of the Lord, release your offender. Let's pray. Father God, I ask that as we respond to you, even in this moment, that you'd let today and the days following be just a time of experiencing freedom for us in here, Lord, for those of us who have been so gripped by the scars and the, the, the pains that have come to us through someone else and, and have had such a difficult time forgiving, Lord, and that we've been in bondage to our own unforgiveness. I pray that, that today, right now, there would be release. There would be release for the one who's wronged us, and then there would be freedom for us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you move even now in this room. I pray that even later as some of us are with our small groups, Father, that you will maybe allow there to be great ministry to one another in this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can trust you, that you are good and you are in control. And we pray this now in Jesus' name.